Good morning. Good morning. Woo, let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see your smiling faces this morning. It's good to have you in worship. Sorry it can't be in the pumpkin patch today. It would be a little soggy um, if we had it outside today. But hopefully the rest of October will prove good enough weather to have um, our worship in the pumpkin patch outside. And we wanted to say a special thank you for yesterday. We saw lots of your faces through here yesterday and sold a boatload of pumpkins. So we're well on our way to paying back what we paid R and R pumpkins and then making our profit, which we're very glad about that. I have just a few other announcements this morning. Our board chair let me know that we're going to move the board meeting one week um, this month. Instead of the 10th, we're going to hold it on the 17th. So if you want to note that, board meeting will be on the 17th. Uh, this is currently our tar target date for Sunday School and Wednesday Night Live here on the back of your bulletin, the 24th for Sunday School at 10 a.m. and the 27th uh, for Wednesday Night Live beginning. It's time to start thinking about new officers and leaders for the church year in the coming year in 2022. So if you have a, someone that you might want to nominate to be a deacon, then we would be happy to receive that name from you so we could pass that on to the nominating committee. And thanks to all who came to unload pumpkins and get the patch set up. It really looks lovely. So we want to say thanks to all. Are there any other announcements this morning? If not, then welcome to those of you who are here in person. Welcome to those of you who are online. That's another important part of our community during this time. And so I want to wish all of you God's peace and a happy World Communion Sunday. We'll be talking about that more later. But for now, I'd like to invite our worship leader, Michael Ann, to begin our worship service. Join me in the call of worship. We gather today as the people of God, as a community of Christ followers. We gather to share word and sacrament, to discern the ways of faithful service. Where in the world shall we serve our God? At, At home, and school, and business place, in this community, and throughout every land. How in the world shall we serve our God? By working toward justice, where there is oppression, by offering comfort, where there is pain, by sharing love, where there is hatred. Why in the world shall we serve our God? Because the Spirit beckons us, because Jesus calls us to enact our faith. Let us now worship the one who calls us. Join us in our opening hymn of praise. Stand as you're able and as you're comfortable, and we're going to sing together, Gather Us In, which is on page 284 in your hymnal. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4, Gather Us In.
join me in prayer. Lord God, as you spoke long ago through the voices of your prophets, speak to us here, speak to us now through the power of your Spirit and the promise of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let us pray this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning to you children of all ages. I do want to say a special hello. I see Lillian back there. You can stay in your seat, but I wanted to say hello, and it was Lillian's birthday this week, so happy birthday to you, Lillian. And I've got Douglas up here with me. Um, he does not like to come forward for children's sermon either, so I really like this time when it's all of us together. So today, I mentioned it briefly, but today is a special day in the life of the church. And does anybody know what day it is? It's the first Sunday of October. World Communion Sunday, it's called. It's a special um, holiday that is celebrated in the church. And it's pretty neat to think that people all over the world, even those that don't regularly take communion Sunday after Sunday like we do, we'll be celebrating at the Lord's table today. Christians all over the world. And it's nice to remember that we are not alone in this sanctuary, that many, many others all across the world are also partaking in this. And so I thought it might be a good idea if we could lift up some places where we might like to pray for people. They can be in the United States, they can be um, across the world, but let's think about what kind of places are on our hearts and minds this morning. Would you tell me some of the places you would like to pray for? I'm going to write them down. Haiti. Haiti. This region has had a special connection with Haiti for a while, and you all have sent several missionaries to Haiti, and they've gone through some disasters recently. So let's be lifting up our brother and sisters in Haiti. Can you think of anywhere else that you might like to pray for people? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yes, I have had the Christians in Afghanistan on my heart and mind. It's not easy to be a Christian in Afghanistan. I think I probably missed some others. Will you help me? Washington, D.C. Washington, yes. where a lot of our nation's leaders um, might, might be participating in worship this morning. We'll lift them up in prayer. St. Jude Hospital. Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. St. Jude Hospital, where Jack and Ariel and Tyler are. Jack has finished his second round of 
chemo, I believe, and is go, continuing to go through treatments. Yes, let's pray for them. Uh, Taiwan is on my heart and mind because my sister is there and she's still in quarantine, so she won't be um, attending worship, any worship services in person, but um, we'll pray for her and for the students that she'll get to be teaching after her uh, quarantine ends later this week. Where else? Texas. All kinds of things going on in Texas. We pray with our brothers and sisters that live in Texas that might be receiving communion at the table today. Any place else on our hearts and minds? The wildfires and where specifically do we just in the west part of our country? Okay. Western part of our country who's dealing with wildfires? California for sure. Yeah. Okay. So when we come to the communion part of our service, it's still kind of different right now as we're trying to be as safe as we can with this pandemic. So we've got our friends at, who are worshiping at home, who partake at home. We are partaking in our seats without having someone pass to us. But the table of God is big and long and wide. So this morning on World Communion Sunday, remember that, uh, that Christians all over the world from Texas to Taiwan, from St. Jude Hospital to the Western United States to Haiti to Afghanistan to Washington, D.C. And all those places we didn't name, they are actually sitting at God's table with us this morning because they will also be partaking in this holy meal that is so important to our worship. So let's pray together um, for the folks in these places. Oh, I have a few more that popped up. Our online folks are participating too. So somebody else named Afghanistan. Rodney's in Del Rio, Texas. Um, he lifted them up the southern border in Louisiana. Absolutely. All right, let's take a moment to go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be your children and we're mindful that you have children all around the world. Sometimes we forget, we get so wrapped up in our lives that are right here in Rome County that we forget about all those Christians around the world who might be experiencing all kinds of different things. So we lift up those who are affected by the wildfires in the western United States. We lift up all the families at St. Jude Hospital. We lift up those in Taiwan, in Texas, in Washington, D.C., in Afghanistan, in Haiti, in Louisiana, and for many other places that we did not name this morning, God, we know that your table is wide and the welcome is wide. You invite anyone to come and see that Jesus is the gift to the world and that we have so much to participate in when we remember him in this sacred meal that we share together. Thank you so much for children all over the world. Watch over them and protect them, and especially those in our congregation. We give you thanks for them, O oh Lord, and ask you to bless each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I have lots on our prayer list this morning. I've got some joys and some concerns. I want to share those with you. And then if there are others that you would like to add to our prayer list, please do. You'll see on the back of your bulletin, I did add a few people on there um, this week. As I mentioned earlier, we had a wonderful fall festival. We can't definitively qualify this with numbers, but we had a lot of sales yesterday. It might have been our biggest fall festival day ever. So that was very exciting for our pumpkin patch. This goes to show you though that it's way beyond uh, pumpkins and fundraising because there were just a lot of folks that got acquainted with people at First Christian Church yesterday. So it was a really nice day to be together. 
Um, I ask you to pray for Tibby and Kathy's granddaughter, Timber. That was the little micro preemie. Remember, they lost one baby and that Timber was born and she was so small and it's been doing pretty well, but she and her brother recently caught COVID and so Timber had to be in the hospital. Those little lungs that are so um, fragile just have a really hard time. She is home now, but continue to put, pray for Timber's recovery from COVID. I ask you to keep our friend Linda Myers in prayer. She's having a lot of pain. As well as our friend Sue Nip. Sue and Virgil are the disciples pastors who come, retired disciples pastors who come. And Sue's been having a lot of nerve pain and had to wait until she could get into a neurologist. So please be lifting her in prayer. I didn't ask her, but I'm going to ask you to pray for Annette because she mentioned yesterday in the patch that she's getting ready to have a knee replacement at the end of the month. So please be praying for her as she prepares for that and be praying for her during her recovery time. Um, Sandy Zurich was hospitalized this week with a bowel blockage. So please be lifting her up in prayer. Yes. She is still in the hospital. Okay. Hopefully home today. Good deal. Okay. We had a pastor's meeting this week in the East Area Clergy, and I checked in with a few folks, and um, I wanted to share a couple of prayer requests from that group. Pastor Josh Toulouse, he serves at um, the Table Christian Church in Knoxville. It used to be First Christian Church. It's now the Table. He is having a horrible time with some ongoing, just chronic vertigo, and they're trying to get to the bottom of it, but... I mean, he's basically homebound, and he's uh, quite a bit younger than me. He's in his 20s. So please be lifting up Josh and that they would find exactly what's causing that and that he could get back to his congregation um, as soon as possible. And then our friend Steve Sherman, who's a pastor in Oak Ridge, his mother was diagnosed with cancer, his mom, Linda, and I asked if we could lift her up. So please be lifting up Linda Sherman. Uh, COVID and all who are dealing with that, we have some folks in our congregation who are um, have COVID now. Thanks be to God, most of them are mild cases, but um, please keep those folks in mind. Uh, Sarah lifted a prayer for college kids who feel overwhelmed. It's about that time of the semester for them to start feeling really overwhelmed, so let's be praying for our college kids. Sarah Taglier's boss, Kathy Mae Martin, she's got um, a father who she recently had to put on comfort care. So um, Sarah asked if we would pray for him. Maria let us know that her cousin Joyce had a stroke and she's doing okay. Doesn't have a lot of lasting damage from that, just weak and tired. But her husband is blind and bed bound with Parkinson's. So it's just complicated recovery time. We want to keep um, Amanda's grandmother, Margie, in her in our prayers. Margie Dunn, she's on your prayer list there. She had a fall and hurt her arm and hip. She's bruised up. And then um, Amanda's friend, Adam, he had a friend, Wes, that we had prayed for who was in an accident and had a broken kneecap and ankle. Uh, his mom was taking him to the doctor this week, and she got in an accident. So now there's another surgery coming on the 8th. So lift up Wesley, or Wes, as he's getting ready to have more surgery. Are there others that we bring this morning that we want to lift in prayer? Tommy Thompson, who lost his wife this week. What was the other one, Marsha? Wyrick. Wyrick. Okay. The Wyrick family. And then Jackson Igu, who's really, really having a hard time with his cancer and having a whole lot of pain. So please be lifting him up and surround his family with your prayers. And then the Wyrick family. Family of Linda Jones. Family of Linda Jones.
Okay. Okay, say the name again. Stan Moore, going through treatment at Vanderbilt. Any other joys or concerns this morning? Yes, thank you. Oh my goodness. Put it out, but almost failed to lift it up. Miss Velma Beckner had a fall this week and broke her hip. So she has had surgery. That surgery went well. She will be in the hospital a little bit. And then when she leaves there, we'll go to um, a rehab facility for a little while for healing on her hip. Thank you for reminding me, Marsha. I had two prayer lists this week, and when I tried to merge them, sometimes they, things get lost. So, yes, please be lifting Miss Velma and her family in your prayers. Marie, when I lifted up the college kids who were feeling uh, overwhelmed this time of year, Maria, who's a college professor, says, and their professors. Let's pray for them, too. Let's take these that we've spoken and the ones that remain unspoken on our hearts and minds, because I know there are others that are unspoken, uh, and go to God in prayer today. We'll take a little time of silence for lifting up those things that are on our hearts and minds, and then um, we'll go to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of love, God of all the children of the world, we thank you for being our loving Father. We thank you that when the prayer list seems so long and we seem overwhelmed by all the needs, that you hold us in the palm of your hand and you hold each one of these who we have lifted up. We ask you to be with Velma, with Stan, with Linda Jones' family, the Wyrick family, with Jackson Igu's family, with Tommy Thompson as he has lost his wife, with Steve's mom, Linda, with Wes who's preparing for another surgery, with Margie as she recovers, with Joyce who is healing from a stroke, for Kathy's dad who is on comfort care, for college kids and the professors who are feeling overwhelmed at this point in the semester, for all those dealing with COVID, for Josh who is struggling with horrible vertigo, for Sandy who is in the hospital still recovering, for Annette who is getting ready to have her knee replacement later this month, for Sue that you would help with that nerve pain, for Linda we ask the same thing for the pain that she's experiencing, we ask you to lift up and strengthen Timber as she recovers from COVID. And God, we thank you and we give you praise and we give you um, all the accolades that come from this wonderful pumpkin patch that we have. We thank you for the fellowship that happened yesterday. We thank you for the fundraising that happened yesterday. We thank you for the evangelism, for people being invited to come to this place of worship. God, you do all kinds of things through our pumpkin patch, and we ask that you would continue to watch over it and bless it for your glory. God, today we are mindful that we are not your only children, that there are others who don't speak the same language or worship in the same way as us, and yet they are just as much your children. And to, today when we gather around your table, we gather with them. And we remember how much you love all of us and what it means to be your child. God, we love you and we lift all these things today in the name of Jesus, our precious Savior and your Son. In his name we pray. Amen.
Amanda. What a beautiful blend of those two hymns. That was really pretty. As I mentioned, today is World Communion Sunday, and I have loved this day since I was a young person at the church. Probably one of my favorite memories is uh, one World Communion Sunday, my pastor and the committee had this big table in front of the church trying to symbolize some different ways that people around the world take communion. So there was some um, unleavened bread, and there were tortillas, and there were just all these kinds of bread choices around the table. And then there was some juice and some wine, which we didn't normally have, and things stationed around the table. And you could come forward and take whatever you wanted. And this little boy, the instructions were to take, you know, one of each, try whatever you wanted. And he, he took it more like a smorgasbord and just kind of snacked along the table. And then you saw him grab that cup of wine, not expecting what that was going to taste like. And that was such an interesting face. I will never forget him uh, snacking along the table. It was fun to watch. Today is the day when Christians all over the world will encounter Christ at the Lord's table and will be unified in a way that we aren't always through the power of this meal. So I wanted to share a little bit more about it. Um, these words were written by a Disciples of Christ regional minister. It was established in 1936, World Communion Sunday, when the war, world was deeply fragmented by the conflict that would later become World War II. World Communion Sunday has been an observance to help Christians all over the world identify their unity in Jesus Christ as expressed so beautifully at the Lord's table. So you can understand why disciples in particular would be uh, keen on this because we recognize and one of our values is unity at the Lord's table. Originating in the Presbyterian Church in 1936, the idea was embraced by what is now the National Council of Churches in 1940. And other denominations, including the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, began to annually participate in this act of Christian unity, which takes place every first Sunday of October. Those Christians who started World Communion Sunday saw the table of the Lord as a place where the wounds of Christendom, and many the result of brutal war, could begin to find healing. The table is a place of healing. At the Lord's table, Christians in all nations of many ethnicities and languages can remember their kinship in Christ and be encouraged to live more fully as brothers and sisters in God's family. That is a remarkable vision. When I think of the context out of which the first World Communion Sunday was born, this is Pastor John's words. Look at the front of your bulletin again. Um, he, cause he's going to talk about our identity statement. That's the top, uh, statement on your bulletin. And we now have a beautiful sign. Um, our sign on this portion of our yard was getting quite sun faded. And so, um, Tracy had it redone on the front to look just like it was before, but in better shape. But on the back now, you have these three statements that are on the front of our bulletin. So it's something to look at and something to give people a clue about our values here at church. So um, Pastor John says, when I think of the context out of which the first World Communion Sunday was born, I cannot help but think of the disciples' identity statement. We are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. So as disciples of Christ, our motivation is similar to those who organized World Communion Sunday. We believe as disciples that the wholeness of our fragmented world is best achieved at the Lord's table where we remember who God is and what God has done for us and where we remember that we are with one another as followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. As our movement, the Disciples of Christ movement, invites and welcomes others to Christ's table, we will be agents of healing for the brokenness that continues to exist in the world. How many of you think that's a relevant kind of church to be? A place that brings um, unity out of brokenness and fragmentation. I think we are prone, prime for such a world as this, such a place as this, such a time as this, 
to bring healing and wholeness, not fixing anybody, but bringing together in unity and creating wholeness at Christ's table. World Communion Sunday was intended to be occasion when people would be invited to the Lord's table in many different churches and denominations. Some of you have been a part of other traditions. Um, were any of you involved in a tradition where you didn't take communion every Sunday, where it was much more rare to be at God's table? Yeah. Um, some people, some uh, traditions observe it, what, four times a year, some once a month. Um, for us, we, we disciples, and especially we lifelong ones, we, we cannot have church without communion. We, can't, we don't even know how to do that. It's really important that we celebrate at the table. I'm personally drawn to World Communion Sunday because it helps us remember what is important as a church. Unity with all Christians, which was a big deal to our founders, and the importance of gathering at the Lord's Supper. Are there guidelines, are there rules for how we're supposed to go about being church? Well, I found a few funny ones in a ministry training I attended, so I wanna share this list with you. This is a top 10 list. See what you think of these. Number 10, we're called to be witnesses, not lawyers. Nine, some people are kind, polite, and sweet-spirited until you try to get into their pew at church. Eight, if a church wants a better pastor, it can begin by praying for the one it has. Thank you very much. Number seven, to err is human, to blame it on someone else is even more human. Six, some minds are like concrete, thoroughly mixed and permanently set. Number five, quit griping about your church. If it were perfect, you wouldn't belong. Number four, if a savior leaves you as you were and where you are, from what has he saved you? Number three, why do some people change churches? What difference does it make which one you stay home from? I'm stepping on some toes now. I did not write this list. Number two, the secret of my success is that at an early age, I discovered I was not God. That's from the author of this list. And number one, every evening, turn your troubles over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. That's a funny little list, sweet little list. It's not actually the rules for doing church together. For that, we head to our scriptures. And to me, this, I know that I say like every fourth time I preach, this is, this is my favorite scripture. But this one is my favorite scripture for how to do church. How to do church, because it's back to the basics. In the book of Acts, we read about, remember that the full name is Acts of the Apostles. This is what the early church did, and it's a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. We think the same person wrote both of those. So this is what happens after the resurrection, even after the ascension of Jesus Christ. How do his followers begin to organize their life together? What do they do after he leaves? There's a new community of believers, and they, they are left somewhat alone. Of course, he's given them the Holy Spirit. We talk about that at Pentecost, and that's earlier in this same chapter of Acts. And they have each other, of course, too. Together, they're figuring out what is our work together as the community of Jesus. What should our life together look like? What will the focus of our energy be? And after reading Acts, I have a lot better idea about what makes a thriving, healthy church. And it's not all about the numbers. A lot of pastors like to compare numbers. Churches compare numbers. It's not all about numbers. But that happened as a result of what the early church did in this particular scripture. There are only four things that they were committed to that helped grow their numbers and helped attract people to their community. That's not too bad. It's not even a top 10 list. It's four things. This is simple, simple at least to say, and to do, to do is a little harder. 
But I think this makes more sense than a lot of church mission statements. I think it's um, better than any long-range church plan I've ever heard. And it's being committed to these four things that you find in Acts 2, 42 through 47. Um, the first one is the apostles' teaching. The second one, fellowship. Third one, breaking of bread. And the fourth one, prayers. What did this plan do for the early disciples? What did it yield for them? It says that they were filled with awe and wonder, that they, their needs were being met, and that people, uh, community needs were also being met, and people were together at temple and at home. They met with glad and generous hearts, and people who praised God, they were people who praised God and enjoyed the goodwill of others. And guess what? Every day, God added to their number those who were being saved. That's what I want for our church. All of that. That sounds good. Let's focus in on being um, an Acts 2 church. Let's look at each of these areas. The apostles' teaching. What's an apostle? Well, it's just the, the 12 disciples and any early follower of Jesus. We call them apostles. When I hear the apostles teaching, I think of the Bible. I think of the tradition of the church, what other followers have written and thought. Those heavy theologians I read in divinity school. What this means to me is that we're supposed to be lifelong learners when it comes to our faith. Are we devoted to that? Do we enjoy learning? One of the things the early followers of Jesus experienced was awe and wonder. Do we ever find awe and wonder when we explore our Bible or a devotion book or a, a book that, a spiritual memoir maybe that spurs us on to reflect on our own spiritual lives? In addition to my Bible time, my scripture time, I'm currently reading a book by Bob Goff, who inspires me a whole lot. He's a favorite spiritual author of mine, and when a new book of his comes out, I make sure to, um, to read that or listen to it. Who are your go-tos? Who are you listening to or reading? During the time of COVID, I've had to put a lot of this back in your hands. We haven't had uh, the community Bible studies the way we've had. We, have, we haven't had Sunday school regularly. You've had to kind of take that on on your own more fully. And so if you need book recommendations or loaners, my office is full. And I, I do have those to recommend. I need your recommendation too. Because I don't have time for bad books. So I need you to vet them for me and then tell me what's good to read. Worship falls under this category. This is how we learn what the apostles want us to know by being fully participate by fully participating in worship. Do we come to worship? Do we love it? If we don't love it, why not? And if the why not is something we can change together, tell Michael Ann and I about it. Michael Ann is the head of the worship committee. She's open to your loving suggestions. I am too. Please don't let my voice be the only voice that you hear on biblical teachings. Read for yourself. Talk to friends. Participate in Bible study when you can. I've got a church-wide Advent series that I am so excited about. It's called The Heart That Grew Three Sizes, Finding Faith in the Story of the Grinch. We're going to look at some um, biblical teachings related to what happens with the Grinch as he changes his heart and life during that um, wonderful story that we love. Find another preacher's perspective. That's one of the things I'm hearing from you during this time. Some former preachers of even Rockwood that you have loved, Ron Buck and Kara, their sermons are online. You can go listen to them too. You can listen to others um, all over the country. So many folks are online right now. Take advantage of that. Don't let someone else tell you what the gospel says. You read it for yourself. Start with Mark if you've never read him. Um, Mark is the Reader's Digest version of all the other ones. He's short, sweet, to the point. Start with Mark. Read it cover to cover. That book. Read it. Fellowship is the second thing that the early church engaged in. And sometimes I think we think that fellowship is just kind of a fluff word. It's just 
Well, just getting together, having fun. Anybody can do that. But it's so important for us to spend time together as the body of Christ. Someone was talking to me recently about um, the online church and uh, what were the benefits and what were the disadvantages. And I said, it's been really interesting to watch this community happen. Those people who are online here, they're not just silently witnessing worship. Some of you have been uh, this. We all have at different points, but they talk to each other in the chat. They ask one another how things are going. Guess what? That is fellowship. We had fellowship in the pumpkin patch yesterday just to see people's faces. It was good. Those of you who came by, it's just good to, to look at one another. Uh, we're pretty good at fellowship when we're not trying to limit being together so much because fellowship usually involves food. And we're real good at church dinners and that kind of thing. We love it. That's why we do that kind of thing. It's not just to eat. Fellowship has been hard during pandemic in all aspects of our lives, but we've, we've done it. We've achieved it, even if it had to be in the chat in Facebook Live. There has been joyous fellowship in the pumpkin patch this week, as I said. I'm so thankful for that opportunity. It's so much more than a fundraiser. Number three, and that's what really fits in for today, is the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread was essential to their life together in the early church. And there's a couple of meanings of this. One is breaking bread as in sharing meals together, a chili supper or beans and greens and whatever uh, food you like. But this is also about um, sharing meals, providing uh, food to folks after funeral services like we do, meals to shut-ins or folks who are going through a hard time, cancer treatment, or just a meal shared with a friend. Of course, this also means being at the Lord's table together, sharing communion, participating in the Lord's Supper. This is tremendously important to our common life together. This is a sacred ritual that invites us to experience the presence of Christ, to know it tangibly. And it makes us one because Christ um, is present when we show up together in community. Nowhere do we have more in common with other Christians than we do at the table during communion time. Today we break bread with people all over the world. It's fun for me to imagine what kinds of bread might be on their tables, how their tables might look. What kind of things they use? Will they be using juice or wine or something else entirely? Sometimes it's strawberry milk at the Cooley house, right? When we're online. Yeah. A symbol of Christ's body and blood, whatever it is that brings you into the presence of Christ is acceptable. The fourth thing is prayer, and that feels pretty obvious, but prayer is so important. Matthew and Mark both say that if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. That's how important. The prayers of God's people are both powerful, are powerful, both the answered ones and the unanswered ones. The act of praying changes us. It's not to change God. It's not to bend God's will to us, but it's to know ourselves better. And just to keep the, the communication open between us and God. We learn in the act of praying that we are not alone. That's important. There are some ways that we're really good at prayer. We're good at prayer for our prayer time here at church, sharing our joys and concerns and lifting one another up. Our women's fellowship has a prayer chain that when someone is in need of some extra prayer, they get on there and call one another and share the prayer concern. We share them sometimes on Facebook. If I have permission, we share them in the newsletter. We have our individual prayer times. But there are other things we can do. We can always pray more. We can pray for those we don't know. We can pray for those unspoken prayer requests because we might not have the details, but God certainly knows. We can learn different ways to pray, different ways to connect. We can ask people to pray for us or with us. 
Some of us have a really hard time with that. You would never know it if we had something going on. We don't want our name on that prayer list, and that's okay. But are you asking someone to pray for you so that you are not carrying that to God alone? Not only tell them, but tell them specifically how you want them to pray for your situation. Sometimes there's a prayer focus in the um, daily devotion we have. If you haven't already gotten an upper room, I know there's one more out there and there's this one that I had laid up here. But every day at the bottom of that, there's a prayer focus. Prayer focus on caregivers on this page I opened to. Uh, prayer focus, new college students. So just something like that to have a new group of people to pray for every day I think can be um, helpful to our prayer time. Four things, pretty simple, four things that help us to be better at church, being church together. And those were teachings, Christian teachings, apostles teachings, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Those four things will get us a long way as a church if we focus in on those four things. And what happens when we do that, when we focus on those four things, these are items not just to help us focus, but to devote ourselves, to, because to be devoted suggests dedication and, and time set apart, time and attention. What wonders will God do with us when we devote ourselves to these things? This is what the early church saw. Just to remind you, this was the fruit of them doing these four things. They experienced awe and wonder. People shared with one another so that the needs of those um, who needed something were met. People be, were together at church and they were together at home. They met with glad and generous hearts. They were people who praised God and enjoyed the goodwill of others. And also... Just as a bonus, the byproduct was that the Lord added daily to their numbers those who were being saved. Do we have room for some more folks in here? We do. And again, numbers aren't the end all, be all. But it sure is fun when the church is full, right? Either the sanctuary or the lawn. It's fun to be with more people and to worship together. So let's continue to devote ourselves to learning, to fellowship, to breaking bread together in prayer. And may we see the wonder of God and be in awe when we follow in the footsteps of the early church. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the reminder that people all over the world are sharing together in communion. We thank you for the reminder of what this table means. And we thank you for your great love. It's Jesus who makes this possible. In his name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you've had the chance to ever travel to another country where you um, were able to take communion with people. Uh, I got to go to an ecumenical worship service in Switzerland once, and um, the thing I remember in addition to communion was that they asked us to say the Lord's Prayer. The worship service was in English, but people from all over the world are in Switzerland for various reasons, and so um, the pastor asked us to say the Lord's Prayer in our own native language. So it was happening in all these languages at the same time. And it's just a reminder that God's church is bigger than we can ever imagine. That there are no language barriers that keep people from the table. There shouldn't be anything that keeps anybody from the table. And I'm so thankful. We now have it in our yard that says all are welcome at God's table. This church is a place of welcome. This table is a place for all. And so we invite you to join in this meal, remembering your brothers and sisters all over the world today who are also partaking in this meaningful meal. As we do, we remember Jesus Christ. and We remember the night that he was to be betrayed. He gathered with his disciples in the upper room and together they shared a meal. 
As they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and passed it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and after giving thanks for it, he passed it to them and said, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Each time you do this, you do so in remembrance of me. God, thank you for making us one at your table. Thank you for calling us to be your children and for including all the world in your table, the invitation to your table. May we continue to reach out and invite others in. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before we have our stewardship time, we were to sing a communion hymn, and I skipped right over it. And it's a wonderful one for today, so let's go back. We're going to sing One Bread, One Body. I invite you to stand as you're comfortable and able, and we'll sing it on verse um, page 393.
birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all things belong to God, and to God all things return. As we give our tithes and offerings today, remember that you can leave your gift in the offering boxes in the narthex or green by the church office during office hours. You can mail your gift to the church or use the online giving platform Givelify. Lord God, you have entrusted us with the works of your own hands. Now we return these gifts to you with thanksgiving and praise. Use them all for your glory and for the good of your world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As we prepare to just depart from this place and go out into the world to serve and invite others to come and share, go with this blessing by one of our um, missionaries in Cuba. May God prosper you. May your days be long and your nights serene. May your friendships honor you and your family love you. May you eat at your table and may you be gathered into God's embrace with a smile. In Christ's name, amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.